BMAT Section 2 Biology Animal Physiology Spend some time looking at the learning objectives for respiration. Cellular respiration. The chemical formula for glucose is Z6H12O6. In most living species, glucose is an important source of energy. During cellular respiration, energy is released from glucose, and that energy is used to help make adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Mitochondria perform cellular respiration and produce energy for the cell. Above is the equation for aerobic respiration, which is a process of breaking down glucose in the presence of oxygen. Anaerobic respiration occurs in the absence of oxygen, and results in the production of lactic acid and ATP, as shown in the equation above. Now let us have a look at the next objective, the nervous system. Central nervous system. The central nervous system, CNS, is made up of the brain and spinal cord, and is covered with three layers of protective coverings called meninges. Sensory neurons act to detect and transduce external stimuli into action potentials, which are propagated along an axon to a relay neuron. Relay neurons are able to transduce neuronal signals to ascending tracts and or descending tracts, such as directly to a motor neuron. A motor neuron propagates signals to effector muscles, in response to the primary stimuli from the sensory neuron. Now, let us move on to the respiratory system. Take a breath in and hold it. Wait several seconds and then let it out. Humans, when they are not exerting themselves, breathe approximately 15 times per minute on average. This equates to about 900 breaths an hour or 21,600 breaths per day. With every inhalation, air fills the lungs, and with every exhalation, it rushes back out. That air is doing more than just inflating and deflating the lungs in the chest cavity. The air contains oxygen that crosses the lung tissue, enters the bloodstream, and travels to organs and tissues. During inhalation the diaphragm descends creating a negative pressure around the lungs, and they begin to inflate, drawing in air from outside the body. The air enters the body through the nasal cavity located just inside the nose. From the nasal cavity, air passes through the pharynx throat, and the larynx voice box, as it makes its way to the trachea. The end of the trachea divides into two bronchi that enter the right and left lung. Air enters the lungs through the primary bronchi. The primary branches divides, creating smaller and smaller diameter bronchi until the passages are under 1 mm, 0.03 in, in diameter when they are called bronchioles as they split and spread through the lung. The final bronchioles are the respiratory bronchioles. Alveolar ducts are attached to the end of each respiratory bronchiole. At the end of each duct are alveolar sacs, each containing 20 to 30 alveoli. Gas exchange occurs only in the alveoli. Now, let us move on to the circulatory system. Here are the objectives. The circulatory system is a network of vessels, the arteries, veins, and capillaries, and a pump, the heart. The heart. The heart is a complex muscle that consists of two pumps, one that pumps blood through pulmonary circulation to the lungs, and the other that pumps blood through systemic circulation to the rest of the body's tissues, and the heart itself. The heart is asymmetrical, with the left side being larger than the right side, correlating with the different sizes of the pulmonary and systemic circuits. In humans, the heart is about the size of a clenched fist. It is divided into four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. There is one atrium and one ventricle on the right side, and one atrium and one ventricle on the left side. The right atrium receives deoxygenated blood from the systemic circulation through the major veins, the superior vena cava, which drains blood from the head, and from the veins, that come from the arms, as well as the inferior vena cava, which drains blood from the veins, that come from the lower organs and the legs. This deoxygenated blood then passes to the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve, which prevents the backflow of blood. After it is filled, the right ventricle contracts, pumping the blood to the lungs for reoxygenation. The left atrium receives the oxygen-rich blood from the lungs. This blood passes through the bicuspid valve to the left ventricle, where the blood is pumped into the aorta. The aorta is the major artery of the body, taking oxygenated blood to the organs and muscles of the body. This pattern of pumping is referred to as double circulation, and is found in all mammals. The cardiac cycle. The main purpose of the heart, is to pump blood through the body. It does so in a repeating sequence called the cardiac cycle. The cardiac cycle is the flow of blood through the heart coordinated by electrochemical signals that cause the heart muscle to contract and relax. In each cardiac cycle, a sequence of contractions pushes out the blood, pumping it through the body. This is followed by a relaxation phase, where the heart fills with blood. These two phases are called the systole, contraction, 
and diastole, relaxation, respectively. Electrocardiogram. The electrical impulses in the heart produce electrical currents that flow through the body and can be measured on the skin using electrodes. This information can be observed as an electrocardiogram, ECG, a recording of the electrical impulses of the cardiac muscle. Moving on to the digestive system. Digestive system. Both physical and chemical digestion begin in the mouth or oral cavity, which is the point of entry of food into the digestive system. The chemical process of digestion begins during chewing as food mixes with saliva, produced by the salivary glands. Saliva contains mucus that moistens food and buffers the pH of the food. Saliva also contains lysozym, which has antibacterial action. It also contains an enzyme called salivary amylase that begins the process of converting starches in the food into a disaccharide called maltose. Another enzyme called lipase is produced by cells in the tongue to break down fats. The esophagus is a tubular organ that connects the mouth to the stomach. The chewed and softened food passes through the esophagus after being swallowed. The smooth muscles of the esophagus undergo peristalsis, a wave-like contraction that pushes the food toward the stomach. A large part of protein digestion occurs in the stomach. The stomach is a sac-like organ that secretes gastric digestive juices. Protein digestion is carried out by an enzyme called pepsin in the stomach chamber. The highly acidic environment kills many microorganisms in the food, and combined with the action of the enzyme pepsin, results in the catabolism of protein in the food. Chemical digestion is facilitated by the churning action of the stomach caused by contraction and relaxation of smooth muscles. The partially digested food and gastric juice mixture is called chyme. Chyme moves from the stomach to the small intestine. The small intestine is the organ where the digestion of protein, fats, and carbohydrates is completed. The small intestine is a long tube-like organ with a highly folded surface containing finger-like projections called the villi. The large intestine reabsorbs the water from indigestible food material and processes the waste material. The human large intestine is much smaller in length compared to the small intestine, but larger in diameter. It has three parts, the cecum, the colon, and the rectum. The cecum joins the ileum to the colon and is the receiving pouch for the waste matter. The colon is home to many bacteria or intestinal flora that aid in the digestive processes. The colon has four regions, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon and the sigmoid colon. The main functions of the colon are to extract the water and mineral salts from undigested food and to store waste material. Now after food has been digested it needs to be excreted which is all down to the excretory system. The human excretory system functions to remove waste from the body through the skin as sweat, the lungs in the form of exhaled carbon dioxide, and through the urinary system in the form of urine. All three of these systems participate in osmoregulation and waste removal. Here we focus on the urinary system, which is comprised of the paired kidneys, the ureter, urinary bladder and urethra. The kidneys are a pair of bean-shaped structures that are located just below the liver in the body cavity. Each of the kidneys contains more than a million tiny units called nephrons that filter blood containing the metabolic wastes from cells. All the blood in the human body is filtered about 60 times a day by the kidneys. The nephrons remove wastes, concentrate them, and form urine that is collected in the bladder. Internally, the kidney has three regions, an outer cortex, a medulla in the middle, and the renal pelvis, which is the expanded end of the ureter. The renal cortex contains the nephrons, the functional unit of the kidney. The renal pelvis collects the urine and leads to the ureter on the outside of the kidney. The ureters are urine-bearing tubes that exit the kidney and empty into the urinary bladder. Now a key aspect to bodily functions is homeostasis, let us delve into this concept. The goal of homeostasis is the maintenance of equilibrium around a specific value of some aspect of the body, or its cells called a set point. While there are normal fluctuations from the set point, the body's systems will usually attempt to go back to this point. A change in the internal or external environment is called a stimulus and is detected by a receptor. The response of the system is to adjust the activities of the system so the value moves back toward the set point. For instance, if the body becomes too warm, adjustments are made to cool the animal. If glucose levels in the blood rise after a meal, adjustments are made to lower them and to get the nutrient into tissues that need it or to store it for later use. Glucose regulation, insulin and glucagon. These hormones regulate blood glucose levels. Alpha cells release glucagon as blood glucose levels decline. 
When blood glucose levels rise, beta cells release insulin. Glucagon causes the release of glucose to the blood from the liver, and insulin facilitates the uptake of glucose by the body's cells. Insulin-dependent, type 1, diabetes mellitus arises from a destructive inflammatory Th1 response against insulin-producing cells of the pancreas. Patients with this autoimmunity must be treated with regular insulin injections. Type 2 diabetes arises either when cells, liver, fat and muscle, become resistant to insulin, or when the pancreas fails to produce efficient insulin to match blood glucose levels. Osmoregulation is the process of maintaining salt and water balance osmotic balance across membranes within the body. The fluids inside and surrounding cells are composed of water, electrolytes, and non-electrolytes. An electrolyte is a compound that dissociates into ions when dissolved in water and diuretic hormone, ADD, is produced in the hypothalamus of the brain and is released in response to hybrosmolality, high water concentration, thus acting to excrete water via the excretory system. Have a look at the objectives for hormones, let us move on. Hormones are released into body fluids, usually blood, which carries them to their target cells, where they elicit a response. The cells that secrete hormones are often located in specific organs, called endocrine glands, and the cells, tissues, and organs that secrete hormones make up the endocrine system. The thyroid gland is located in the neck, just below the larynx, and in front of the trachea. It is a butterfly-shaped gland with two lobes that are connected. The thyroid follicle cells synthesize the hormone thyroxine, which is also known as T4, because it contains four atoms of iodine, and triadothyronine, also known as T3, because it contains three atoms of iodine. Epinephrine, adrenaline, and norepinephrine, noradrenaline, cause immediate, short-term changes in response to stressors, inducing the so-called fight-or-flight response. The responses include increased heart rate, breathing rate, cardiac muscle contractions, and blood glucose levels. Epinephrine, adrenaline, and norepinephrine, noradrenaline, are released from the adrenal glands. Hormonal control of reproduction. The ovarian and menstrual cycles occur concurrently. The first half of the ovarian cycle is the follicular phase. Slowly rising levels of FSH cause the growth of follicles on the surface of the ovary. This process prepares the egg for ovulation. As the follicles grow, they begin releasing estrogen. The first few days of this cycle coincide with menstruation, or the sloughing off of the functional layer of the endometrium in the uterus. After about five days, estrogen levels rise and the menstrual cycle enters the proliferative phase. The endometrium begins to regrow, replacing the blood vessels and glands that deteriorated during the end of the last cycle. Just prior to the middle of the cycle, approximately day 14, the high level of estrogen causes FSH and especially LH to rise rapidly then fall. The spike in LH causes the most mature follicle to rupture and release its egg. This is ovulation. The follicles that did not rupture degenerate and their eggs are lost. The level of estrogen decreases when the extra follicles degenerate. The cells in the follicle undergo physical changes and produce a structure called a corpus luteum. The corpus luteum produces estrogen and progesterone. The progesterone facilitates the regrowth of the uterine lining and inhibits the release of further FSH and LH. The uterus is being prepared to accept a fertilized egg, should it occur during this cycle. The inhibition of FSH and LH prevents any further eggs and follicles from developing, while the progesterone is elevated. The level of estrogen produced by the corpus luteum increases to a steady level for the next few days. If no fertilized egg is implanted into the uterus, the corpus luteum degenerates and the levels of estrogen and progesterone decrease. The endometrium begins to degenerate as the progesterone levels drop, initiating the next menstrual cycle. The decrease in progesterone also allows the hypothalamus to send GnRH to the anterior pituitary, releasing FSH and LH and tarting the cycles again. Have a look at these objectives, now let us move on. Introduction to Disease and Body Defense Organisms have a wide array of adaptations for preventing attacks of parasites and diseases. The vertebrate defense systems, including those of humans, are complex and multi-layered, with defenses unique to vertebrates. These unique vertebrate defenses interact with other defense systems inherited from ancestral lineages and include complex and specific pathogen recognition and memory mechanisms. Protection by the immune system is against communicable diseases caused by pathogenic bacteria, viruses, protists and fungi. Viruses are acellular parasitic entities that are not classified within any domain because they are not considered alive. 
they have no plasma membrane, internal organelles, or metabolic processes, and they do not divide. Instead, they infect a host cell and use the host's replication processes to produce progeny virus particles. HIV infects Th cells using their CD4 surface molecules, gradually depleting the number of Th cells in the body. This inhibits the adaptive immune system's capacity to generate sufficient responses to infection or tumors. As a result, HIV-infected individuals often suffer from infections that would not cause illness in people with healthy immune systems, but which can cause devastating illness to immune-compromised individuals. A vaccine may be prepared using weakened live viruses, killed viruses, or molecular subunits of the virus. In general, live viruses lead to better immunity, but have the possibility of causing disease at some low frequency. Killed viral vaccine and the subunit viruses are both incapable of causing disease, but in general lead to less effective or long-lasting immunity. Antivirals can be used in the treatment of the retrovirus HIV, which causes a disease that, if untreated, is usually fatal within 10-12 years after being infected. Anti-HIV drugs have been able to control viral replication to the point that individuals receiving these drugs survive for a significantly longer time than the untreated. Antibiotics kill bacteria and are naturally produced by microorganisms such as fungi. Penicillin is perhaps the most well-known example. Antibiotics are produced on a large scale by cultivating and manipulating fungal cells. The fungal cells have typically been genetically modified to improve the yields of the antibiotic compound. Drug discovery occurs in two main phases clinical and preclinical. Preclinical includes the testing on cell cultures and animals, whereas clinical includes the testing on human volunteers followed by registration and commercialization of said drug or treatment. Non-communicable diseases are caused by the interaction of many factors, however, mainly genetic and environmental factors. Non-communicable diseases include cardiovascular disease, many forms of cancer, some lung and liver diseases and diseases influenced by nutrition, including type 2 diabetes. Cardiovascular disease. Treatments includes statins which lower cholesterol, anticoagulants which act to thin blood, and antihypertensive drugs which act to reduce blood pressure. Surgical procedures for diseases. A coronary stent is a device used to keep open a narrowed vessel, so that innervation with blood of a vessel may continue. Alternative therapies for a wide variety of diseases include exercise. Exercise is known to improve blood supply, lower resting heart rate, which all lead to benefits in the management of diseases such as cardiovascular disease. That is a summary of animal physiology for the BMAT exam. Thank you learners, next video is on ecosystems.